My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. With a clap innovation, can we receive to the mic? God's servant. Apostle Michael Orupo. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Reverend has already begun to stir the, the atmosphere and um, if we lose the service. Apostle told me, he said, um, when the anointing comes on you and your soul is full of the pressure, what happens is that your words come out like bullets. And as those words come out like bullets, they strike men at the point of their needs and bring solutions to the crisis of their lives. He said, however, if you are carried away by the euphoria of the anointing, you will not educate people. And if people are not educated, they will remain stunted in their growth. And that is the deficiency that the body of Christ suffers currently in our day and time. We have a church that gathers millions of people at different grounds, but most of them are babes that look up to men who are superstars to bring the counsel of God and to bring the resources of the spirit that they were supposed to draw from their spirit on account of the revelation of the Holy Ghost. So tonight, we can't go with the window. We'll do a little education from the, the scriptures before we, we take our flight in the spirit. Since we have observed protocol already, I will not go through the route, but I celebrate you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. I love that man of Galilee. He has done so very much for me. He has forgiven all my sins and placed the Holy Ghost on me. I love that man. Of Galilee, I love the man. I love the man of Galilee. He has done so very much for me. He has forgiven me all my sins and saved the Holy Ghost. I love that man of Galilee, of Galilee. I love the man. You know this song is meant to open your soul. It's not for the move of the spirit. It's to open your soul. So very There is such a thing as spiritual understanding. The things of the spirit, they don't function at the frequency of the mind. When knowledge is imparted by the spirit, it comes to amplify your mind. So that you can catch and touch things at a higher energy level. Oh Galilee! I love the night of oh, Galilee. He has done 
so very much for me. He has forgiven me all my sin and sin. The Holy Ghost in me, I love the God of Galilee. Oh, Galilee! I love the man of Galilee. He has done so very much for me. He has forgiven me all my sins and sins. The Holy Ghost in me. I love the God of Galilee. Of Galilee. I love the He has done so very much for me. Very much. He has forgiven me all my sins and sins. The Holy Ghost in me. I love that man. Hey, oh, Galilee. Oh, Galilee.
we make religion out of spirituality. So we don't receive the most of God because we make a religion out of spirituality. Spirituality is meant to be the simplest thing on earth. Because before you are admitted into the corridor of participation with the eternals, the immortals, and the spiritual, you are first of all qualified by grace. And you are enabled by eternal life. So you are not expected to use your abilities. You are expected to use the provisions that God has made available. In fact, the essence of spiritual tutelage is to bring you into exposition and knowledge as to how to appropriate the spiritual realities that have been made available to you. When you see Christians struggling, it's because they lack the requisite knowledge on appropriating the things that have already been given to them. And the unfortunate thing is that you can never make headway in the part of life as it pertains to the spirit on the energy of the flesh. It's not possible. So after so many Moments in God's presence, meditation, it dawned on me that one of the greatest problems of Christians is the inability to appropriate the things that God has freely given to us. So tonight, or this evening, I want to share with us very briefly on some of the cardinals of the faith. What makes us victorious? Those are the things I want to share with us. But I want to let you know before I begin that the Bible says it says knowing this first no prophecy of the scripture is of any individual interpretation. It says holy men of God speak as they were moved as they were carried by the spirit of God. So the veracity of scriptures cannot be challenged in any quarters. He said the word of God is yea and in Christ is a man. And this is what the word of the Lord says. He said according as his divine power has given us everything that pertained unto life and to godliness. According as what? His divine power has given us what? All things that pertained to life and godliness. But he said it is through the knowledge through the epignosis of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. The word knowledge used in that scripture is the word the unveiling. According to the revelation of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. So if there is any part of your life where there is lack, where there is want, 
then it means you lack the revelation of Christ in that part of your life. And the counsel is not for you to try. The counsel is for you to yield. Because as you yield, the Holy Spirit will bring you into the understanding of what ought to be done in order to achieve that which God has provided for you on account of His grace. Are we together? So, nobody here has any lack from the vistas of heaven. Not one of us here has what? Any lack. Because the only answer God has for humanity is himself. And he has given himself already. If you are still making demand on God outside of his provisions, it means you are telling God that what he has provided is not good enough. And unfortunately, God has nothing else to offer. So what we need to know is the revelation on how to appropriate the things that God has provided. It's not been long I've been introduced to this syllabus. I'm just coming to share with you some of the things that I've learned. Because I've seen that there is a lot of struggle. I've attended camp meetings, I assure you. The first time I traveled to Lagos was on account of ministry. I reached Lagos with 800 naira in my pocket. I was almost stranded. But I went because there was passion. I've been to the biggest campsites. The last meeting Reinhard Bonke organized in Lagos, I was there. And we slept on the field. Because there was no money for hotel. We went when it was tight. And it dawned on me that the multitude of people that run after men of God... They don't run there because of the love of God. They run there because they have needs and challenges in their lives. But what God has for humanity is not a man of God. What God has for humanity is himself. So if we must receive spiritual education, we need to know how to appropriate the things that God has provided for us. The Holy Ghost particularly in instructed me to be simple and basic tonight. I was in Kaba on Sunday to minister at the NYC orientation camp. The power of God moved for more than two hours. And after the meeting, a young man came to me and said, Sir, I just want to let you know that you know the ancient wells. That's the Christianity we practice now. Young people saying bogus things and big things that they don't have understanding of. I just want to let you know that you know the ancient wells. <laughs> so we see all the big, big things. But our life is a contradiction of everything we claim to know. And as far as spiritual equation is concerned, you don't know until it manifests. Because it is the manifestation of the spirit that profits. It is the manifestation of the spirit that profits. The moment you know, it manifests. If I intend to handle the matters one by one, it will be a challenge. So I will handle what the basics of the faith are this evening. I will just touch two of them. And when we are done, we will begin to pray. Hallelujah. When we are done with that, we'll begin to pray. In order to lay hold of the things that God has provided, your soul needs to be aligned with your spirit. Because even though God has provided everything that we need for life and godliness, the unfortunate is that God did not provide it in the quarters of the soul. They were supplied to our spirit. They are not in our soul. Because if God were to place them in our soul, they will suffer corruption. Because salvation begins from the spirit. It travels through the soul to the body and the circumstances. God has finished the work of salvation in the spirit. And in fact, according to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, he said, after God saved us, he sealed us from corruption. So the spirit is sealed. But where you need to express the things that God has given to you is in the soulish realm and in the physical world. So in order for those things to be transported from your spirit to the physical world, you need what? Soul alignment. 
Your soul needs to be jacked up to the energy level of the spirit for you to manifest the things that are locked up in your spirit. And if your soul is not jacked up to that energy level, even though you have everything that you would ever need in life, you will suffer frustration until you leave this world. And when you leave this world and you appear in heaven, then you will know that it was not supposed to be so. And it's not God's fault. It is your fault. Because you have the word, you have the prophets and the apostles, and you have the Holy Ghost. So, remove your mind first from those things that you know are spiritual. Let's leave the ancient wells for now. And see a few things that are in scripture and that are basic. Are we together? Let's leave the ancient wells for now. I know the, you have mighty utterances, mighty revelations, but let's examine the basics. I would have you know that when God created man, there were three cardinal objectives that God had as revealed in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. The Bible said, let us make man in our own image. In our own likeness. And let them have dominion. These three things were expected to address the needs of man in all of the realms of existence. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And the devil knew that the moment the project man was completed, man will rule as the God of this world. So the devil came and truncated those three quarters of creation. So the image process was distorted, the likeness process was distorted, and the dominion process was distorted. Are we together? So instead of the image of God, man became the image of himself. Self-life became the most predominant aspect of man. And the way the devil did that is to create the lust of the eyes. According to the law of the spirit, what you see, you become. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of law of the Father have lavished on us, that we should be like the sons of God. John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, from verse 1. He said, it does not yet appear what we shall be like. He said, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him. So, for man to advance in the image of God, man was expected to be hooked up to God constantly and to constantly behold his image. So that he will grow in that likeness. But the devil came and distorted the process so there was a mutation in the process of man and man began to look at other things so he no longer looked like God in manifestation. Hope you know the Bible says, are we together? The Bible says, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed into that image. So what you see determines the image that you present. So the devil destroyed the process and the lust of the eye caused a mutation that made man not to appear and be reflected like the image of God anymore. But when Jesus came, the Bible told us what the original man was supposed to look like. He said, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in this last day, spoken unto his, us by his son, who is a Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. That was the heritage of mankind. But the mutation distorted that process. And the gateway through which that was achieved was the lust of the eyes. The second thing that was distorted was the likeness of God. The likeness of God was the ability and the capacity that God put in man to reflect his characteristics. So when we look upon you, you were supposed to express God in all of your activities in life. But even the likeness was destroyed. And it was substituted by the lust of the flesh. So man was truncated from his fellowship with God and the appetites of man changed. So man began to feed himself with other things. Things that caused him to grow in a different orientation from the orientation of God. And that man suffered mutation. Instead of being the likeness of God, he became the likeness of the devil. So Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you are of your father the devil. 
Because every manifestation of the children of the, of, 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 of the Pharisees were of the devil. Even though they were people of covenant. Even though they were people that were separated unto God, their manifestation was the manifestations of the devil. So he said, you are of your father, the devil. And that was because man chose to obey the devil. And according to the law of the spirit, he said, whoever you yield yourself servant to obey, the servant of him you are, whom you what you obey. And the third is dominion. The capacity for dominion was replaced with the pride of life. The reason you showcase pride most of the time is because you try to exhibit who you really are. But you don't have the resources to exhibit it. So you fake it. That's what pride is. So somebody knows he's great. But the resources are no longer there to manifest greatness. So he makes, he tries to falsify it. And then the little he can show part time, he makes a boast of it in case it doesn't happen again. But a man of dominion is not quick to manifest. You know, it is said that great men are not dressed in gold. He said, but when you scratch, you discover they are what? They are made of gold. So the reason for pride is because dominion was lost. Dominion was what? Was lost. So man tries to make a show of the little that he can achieve by the frequency of the energy of the flesh. That is the mutation that we suffered. That is the fall that man suffered. So even the very realm that man lived in, the realm was lost to the devil. And when the devil challenged Jesus on the mount of temptation, he said, bow down to me. And he said, I will give you the earth and the glory thereof. For it has been delivered unto me. And Jesus never challenged that statement. Because it was a fact. Adam had delivered the realms to the devil. But the good news is that God has an answer for mankind. That answer is one of the things that forms the basics of the faith. The answer that God has for what? For mankind. It forms the basics of the faith. Because when we fell, the lens through which we were supposed to look at the world and operate, which is the lens of faith, was lost. So we now analyze things from our minds, which is a defeated faculty. We analyze things from our senses, which is a defeated faculty. Faith, which was the lens through which we should interface with the world, was lost. So that was no longer a possibility. But the only way God, or the only thing God had to restore that which was lost, was trapped in Christ Jesus. And that thing forms the basics of our faith. That was the answer that God gave to principalities and powers. That was the answer that God gave in order to restore the universe back to its original status. That answer was in Jesus Christ. But before Jesus answered or gave that answer, Jesus had to pass the test that man failed in the Garden of Eden. The test of the pride of life. The test of the lust of the eyes and the test of the lust of the flesh. Jesus had to pass that test before that answer could be invoked from the immortal realms. The devil came to Jesus and he said, if you are the son of God. Now the question, why is son of God the question? Why is being the son of God the bone of contention? Because the son of God is the bone of contention because for, resor- for, for, for restoration to be achieved on the earth realm, the sons of God must be manifested. Because the Bible said, the earth, it said creation suffers in travail. It is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So every time anybody comes and manifested any dimension of God, the devil accosted that person. Because the devil wants to know, is this the son of God? Is this the one that is going to bring salvation back to the earth? So that the process will be truncated. But the devil also knew that because man is falling, and the first man who was the original man fell to the test of the lust of the eyes, of the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, every other man that follows that sequence will also fall. So that has been the tool that the devil uses to advance and destroy mankind from day one. That tool is on the seat of lust. And that was the tool that the devil came with to approach Jesus with. He said, if you are the son of God, if you are the one that is going to bring salvation to the world, he said, turn these stones to become bread. Now that temptation came after Jesus was hungry for 40 days. And Jesus said to him, Say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Father. That is because for the lust of the flesh to be addressed, 
the appetite and the things that we feed our flesh with must be substituted for the word of God. Because the word of God is the cure to that mutation that man suffered. So Jesus was not just answering the devil. Jesus was pro providing the cure that mankind need. So if there's any aspect of your life where you suffer mutation or decay or death, it's because the revelation of the word has not been provided in that area of your life. So Jesus said, for the lust of the flesh to be overcome, man must live by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the father. And the devil did not stop there. The Bible said he took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, he said, cast yourself from this place and it is written that angels will bear you lest you cast thy feet against a stone. And Jesus answered him and said, <laughs> who knows the answer Jesus gave? It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That was the test for the lost of the eyes. Jesus saw the glory of the world. He saw the glory of the world. He saw the glory of the world. And he said, bow down to me. Bow down to me. And that was when Jesus said, away from me. Away from me. Away from me. Jesus is not moved by anything he sees. The only thing that moves Jesus is the image of the Father. He overcame the test for the lust of the flesh. The test for the pride of life. And the test for the lust of the eyes. Immediately he did that. He attained the qualification that was required to invoke the solution for humanity. And that solution is the answer that God gave. And that answer is captured in Romans chapter 1 verse 3. He said concerning Jesus Christ. Who he made according to the flesh to be the son of David. And caused to what? To be resurrected from the dead by power through the spirit of holiness. So the resurrection from the dead is the answer to the decadence of humanity. The resurrection from the dead is what? The answer to the decadence of humanity. If the revelation of the resurrection from the dead has not downed on you, you will be quoted and say it that you are this, you are that. But your life will be an outright contradiction of everything you quote and everything you say. That's why a lot of us are talking, but a lot of us are beggarly. You go for a crusade of 9 million people and close to 9 million people came there dependent. Only one man has the capacity to provide answers. That's not the equation. That is because the revelation of what? The resurrection is not there. Now, when you gave your heart to Jesus and when you received eternal life into your soul, by what means was he achieved? He said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus and confess, you will be saved. He said, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is what? Made unto salvation. So there are two things that procures and provides answer for humanity. The first is what? The resurrection from the dead. The second is the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is the emphasis of my child tonight. I want to talk to you briefly about the resurrection from the dead and about the lordship of Jesus Christ before we begin to pray. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14 and 17 to 22 he made four very profound statements. He said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, you are still in your sins. He said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, your faith is vain. He said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain. And he said, if only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. So the resurrection from the dead is the, the most potent tool you have to live and overcome us life on earth. The reason there are a lot of us who have challenges in every area of our life is because there is no revelation of the resurrection from the dead. So when we come for meetings like this, our goal should not be, Lord, touch me. That is important because we are growing and we are at different levels. So what our faith cannot conquer 
we receive by the anointing. But if we remain there, then there is a defect in our growth process. So when we come for meetings like this, we should come to receive tools. The Bible said, to some he gave to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting is the word katadismos. It means for the equipping of the saints. So the first and most important emphasis of the fivefold ministry is not to impart you, is to equip you. But a lot of Christians are not equipped. And because they don't even know the basics. I was interacting with a man today who was supposed to be ordained a priest, but unfortunately he didn't. I don't know what happened. And we were discussing. And I said, what is at the foundation of the Christian faith? The man said, well, it's to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, that's good. I said, what? How did you achieve salvation? He said, because he loves his neighbor. I said, there are atheists that love their neighbor. And they even sacrifice much more than most people who are preachers. And then, this love we are talking about, what kind of love is it? Is it, the one, is it just the act? Or is there a way you can explain this love? He said, no, no, it's just to act. Anybody that loves somebody, it, it, it's good to go. I said, ah. I said, even the Catholic Church where you belong, that's not the foundation of the faith of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church believes in the resurrection from the dead. They believe in the virgin birth. They believe in the forgiveness of sin. They believe in the communion of the sin. And they believe in eternal life. And you are a Catholic. And you don't, you have not even quoted the foundation of your faith as a Catholic church. So how do we even begin to discuss the scriptures? The guy said, well, the scripture was written by men. He said, it may be an inspiration from God. It may not be. This is somebody who was supposed to be ordained a priest. And I said, I now showed him 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 and 21. And I showed him 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. That gave clearly how that every scripture was given by the inspiration of God. He said, man, he wrote it. He said, even we in the thief nation here, it's because that time we were not enlightened. If we were enlightened, we would have written our own Bible. That what we are practicing is the tradition of the Jews. <laughs> it dawned on me that there is a problem. There's a problem. But Paul said, he said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, he said, your faith is vain. That means everything you believe is a lie. You have only wasted your time. You have wasted your life. He said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, our preaching is vain. So there is no even basis for preaching if there were no resurrection from the dead. He said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, those that died have perished. There's no hope for them. They are perished. But thanks be to God, Christ rose from the dead. And in every area of our life where there is challenge, where there is defeat, what we need to do is not to run after men, is to get the revelation of the resurrected Christ in that area of our lives. And that is why the ability to appropriate the things that are freely given to us by God becomes a very important part of our faith and it's going to be the cure to a lot of challenges that we have in the body of Christ but the question is how do you appropriate this revelation how how do you come about this revelation because it's not a cognitive thing you can hear about it and leave this meeting and say the cardinal thing in the faith is resurrection from the dead you don't know it because I told you knowledge is what experiential and it comes by revelation the word knowledge in the Greek is epignosis and is gnosko. A revelation that brings you into experience. So if you have not experienced it because it has not come to you by revelation, you don't know it. So you may still say it and still be in problem. So how do you come about this revelation? I'll give you three things. The first is by meditation on the word. The practice of meditation is lost in the body of Christ. So a lot of persons are talking. We are quick to talk. We want to talk. I went to preach in a meeting. The power of God was healing. There was a lady that had a heart condition. She was healed instantly. And somebody comes to me and says, Sir, you know the ancient wells. That was his inspiration from that meeting. 
And of course, you know, when you go for evangelical meeting, you are coming as a striker. It's not a place to establish doctrine. So you, you just hook up to the Holy Ghost and, and hit the ground by the power of God. It's different from a meeting like this. But that was his inspiration. Meditation. You see, the Bible said in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, He said, Christ is dead and is alive unto God. He said, You therefore recon, recon that you are dead with Him and that you are alive to the newness of life. Recon. That means calculate it unto yourself that you too died in Christ and that you too are alive. So if there is sickness in your body, what you do is what? You reckon that you are dead. And this life you are living now is by the resurrected power. You are now powered by the resurrected power. So it kills the sickness. If you see any man walking in divine health, that's what he knows. Because if the spirit of him that rose up Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will revitalize your mortal body. So you reckon that what? You are dead with Christ and you are now alive unto God. So the life, what powers you down is not what powers the natural man. There is something working in you that is more efficacious than blood. It is called the Holy Spirit. It revitalizes your mortal body. The man that comes to lay hands on you, what do you think leaves him to heal you? It is the Spirit. But you must apprehend this in the place of meditation. You look at it. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, I assure you. Because it's not the calculation in your mind. And the, the whole thing would defy your reasoning. Because it doesn't make sense. How you'll be sick and then you are saying you are healed. And it doesn't begin with talking. And that's where we miss it. It doesn't begin with talking. Because there are two kinds of talking when it comes to developing your faith by meditation. The first kind of talking is you see the word and you plant it in yourself. So you confess the word to yourself until it becomes real to you. Apostle has taught us here how that there are some persons he don't want to be bitter with. And then he tells himself he loved this person. He loved this person. He is talking it to himself until it becomes what? It, when it's planted in his consciousness, then that love becomes a reality. Then he can say it to the person. So you don't begin by talking it. Because the word meditation is actually the word hagar. It means to mortar it. But there are a lot of Christians that don't have the time for that responsibility. They prefer to go and wait for a prophet for two weeks. But if they had spent that two weeks in the presence of God, their challenges would have been met. So we don't take responsibility in the Christian faith. We rely on others. If you get all the word, for instance, you are sick, you get all the scriptures that speaks about healing. And you are talking it to yourself every day. A point comes when it becomes real to you that you are not sick. At that point, what happens is that that word that is planted is remalized. So as you speak it forth, you see the manifestation. So meditation is one way through which you activate the resurrection power. The Bible says we all with open faces beholding, beholding. Beholding. You look at it every day. You contemplate it in your mind. You talk it to yourself until it becomes your reality. And Rob Aka raised the dead three times. And he heals. He, he, he literally heals at will. If he prays for you, you are not healed. He will show you the scriptures and pray again. That was how people like Ora Robos operated. In their meetings, they say all the sick people come and line up here. The power of God comes to his hand. He will hit it on you. You will be healed. And all kinds of sicknesses. Some of these people, Andrew Omar, for example, he said he meditated on some scriptures for 16 hours every day for one year. Until that thing is planted. That's why it takes time. When I to say 10 years, it's not because you are just sitting and waiting for 10 years. It takes time for the denatured humankind to be restored back to the original form. There's a mutation in your faculties. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. The pride of life. All of these things are infirmities of the soul. It takes a while for that soul to realign to the spirit. The only way it can be achieved is when the word of God is planted. That's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
Every word that proceeded from the mouth of the father. Jeremiah said, I found thy word and I did eat it. You eat it. That's what meditation taught. In the place of meditation, what you're actually doing is that you are eating the word of God. You eat it until it becomes your reality. And when it becomes your reality, the Holy Ghost transports you into it. So we all with open faces beholding us in the glass, the image of the Lord. We are carried. We are metamorphosed into that image by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost comes into play when the word has been planted. You want to see yourself manifesting the fruits of the Spirit? Love, patience, kindness. It's not a discipline. The Chinese monk has more discipline than most Christians. But it is not powered by eternal life. So in the, in the, in the, in the standards of God is zero. The one God talks about is the one that is born from the Spirit. And that can only be achieved when that word is what? Is planted in your spirit. The second way to achieve it is by prayers. It's by prayers. A lot of Christians don't pray. It's no longer a, 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 a profitable venture. So we prefer to come and receive prophetic words. I love prophetic words. I receive them a lot. Because it helps, it, it addresses a lot of challenges. And it helps, it helps save time for certain things. And God knows, that's why he gave it. But the goal of God is for you to become like him. It's becoming that is the first goal. He said, they that believe, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The first dimension of the power of God that visited the human race is the power to become. So becoming is the first emphasis in the calendar of God, in the archives of God. And you hit that revelation by prayers. In Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 17, Paul said, He said, I pray to the Father that he may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So you can lay hold on revelation. By what? By prayers. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, Paul said, He prays for them daily that they may what? They may have an understanding of the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So you can come into spiritual understanding by prayers. But a lot of us don't pray. We are not instructed in righteousness. This is one of the reasons for the scriptures. He say all scriptures were given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable unto instruction. That's one of the reasons. Instruction. Reproof. Correction in righteousness. He said that the man of God may be complete. Thoroughly furnished unto every good work. But we don't follow the instructions of the Bible. We prefer to run around and wait for people. And we make a superstar out of men. The ministry of prayers. Reverend Tony was sharing. And he said the apostles zeroed down on two cardinal things. He said we will give ourselves. It's not meat. It's not reasonable for us to attend to tables. He said we will give ourselves to the ministry of prayers and the word. There's a Christian who can pray. He's alive but he's dead. You stumble on revelation in the place of prayers. It is imparted like light. And light is given in quanta. It's not continuous. You may see it like a continuous thing. But it is given in packets. In packets. As you come every day, it is released. As you come every day, it is released. Until a time come, it downs on you that you are no longer where you used to be. Have you not seen when you go to wear your clothes and you discover the clothes have become a jumper? You don't know when it happened. But one day you came and discovered you have grown. Your shoes can't enter anymore. That's how these things work. It is called metamorphosis. You are transformed by the spirit. But it is achieved in the place of prayers. The reason we have, we are full of challenges is because we are not given to the ministry of prayers. And until we pray and ask specifically, we can never have the revelation of the resurrected Christ. And if that revelation does not hit your soul, you will remain a babe in the things of God. 
The reason you are under many laws and elements of this world is because you are a babe. Anybody at all. Myself. The places where I'm struggling is because I'm a babe in those places. The Bible said the heir, so long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. The word child is the word nepios. It means you lack understanding. You are a child in knowledge. He says, so the father places you under tutors and governors. It's God that placed you there. You are buffeted until you come into understanding. That's why sometimes it's circumstances that force a lot of us to the place of prayer. God will not move until you move. So let's quit this Christianity of having people meet our needs and grow up. Sometimes when you come to the presence of God, the only thing he gives you are instructions. God doesn't heal. Jesus never healed for many days. The only thing he did for many days was teaching. It's instruction. 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 When it comes to healing, it just flows and it goes away. The only thing he spends days on is teaching, teaching, teaching. And if you are somebody who has not sold yourself out to the ministry of prayers... Know that those challenges you have will be there for long. Because most of the challenges you have, they were orchestrated by demons. And demons, they don't quit. They don't quit. They are only subdued. Jesus said, when an evil spirit is cast out of a man, he goes about in desolate places. He said, not finding where to stay, he returns back to where it was casted from. If he finds it clean and garnished but empty, he returns with several more wicked demons. So that is Jesus that casted out the devil does not keep you saved. What keeps you saved is for you to grow so that you can contend with the devil by the power of God. That's why you have the Holy Ghost. What keeps you healed is not because they prayed for you by the anointing. What keeps you healed is because you have grown in faith and you have the revelation of eternal life. If you don't have it, you will need healing and you will keep needing healing. It is the ministry of prayers. Ministry of prayers. Meditation and prayers. They are cardinal emphasis in the faith. Because only by them can you come about the mystery of the resurrection. Do you know the funny thing about faith? Faith is not believing. Believing is a mental accent. So you can look at something, calculate, 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 and then you believe and you call it faith. That's not faith. Faith is imparted. If I look at this chair now, I weigh it. I know it can carry me. So I believe in the chair. That's not faith. In fact, the process by which faith is imparted is not known. It's called the mystery of faith. Paul says you should keep the mystery of faith in godliness, in holiness, in fear. It's a mystery. How it is imparted, you don't know. All you need to do is allow the word to get into you. When that word gets into you, faith is born. And that's why prayers and meditation is so important. You see people doing all kinds of activity. And at the end of the day, it doesn't profit anything. In fact, the point came and I told God, help us. Help us. You come for meetings, people are falling down everywhere. And then you go for meetings, you see people falling down in their millions. And there's no change in the society. There's a challenge. That's not the goal of Jesus. Jesus. In the ministry of Jesus, people fell only once. The only time people fell was when they came to arrest him. He said, who seek thou? He said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I'm he. And they went back and fell. That was the only time. In the ministry of the apostles, people fell once. The Bible said they returned to their company as they prayed. The place where they were was was shaking. The Greek word is falling. It's not the foundation of building that literally shook. People, they fell on the ground under the power and everywhere was in uproar. So what the apostles used to change the world was not falling under the anointing. Pastor Tony was talking to us here. He said, the power dimension is not the falling. Even under the context of the gift, the power gift, is the gift of faith, the gift of healing, and the gift of the workings of miracles. That's the power gift. It's not falling. Falling is the demonstration of the spirit. It is a pointer to something. And when you grow in power, what happens is that the kingdom rages out of you. You push back darkness. You challenge darkness in whatever form. 
Do we really have the power? There's a challenge. We need to look inward now and do it the way of scriptures. The way of scriptures. The way of scriptures. The third way to achieving and coming into the reality of the revelation is by obedience. It is in the context of the obedience that we have the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I told you that the two things at the base of the Christian faith is what? Is the revelation and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is in the context of the Lordship that we have obedience. When revelation hits you, what happens is that the things that are in your spirit are transported to your soul. I told you that everything that pertains to life and godliness has been given to us, but it is what? It is planted in our spirit. It is revelation that bets it in our soul. That's why the word revelation is called unveiling, apocalypsis. It is opened up to your soul. What obedience does is that it causes you to walk into its reality. It is in obedience that transformation is achieved experientially. One of the tools the Holy Ghost uses to bring us into experiential realities, it is called the obedience of the faith. Pastor Tony was sharing from Acts chapter 6 and he said what? The word of the Lord grew mightily in Ephesus and he said most many of the priests became obedient to the faith. It is obedience that brings change. You see, the mighty works, signs and wonders we desire, they are not achieved by wishful thinking. They are achieved on the pathway of obedience. Everybody that wrought wonder for God, he was obeying God and wonders were manifesting. Jesus said, go ye into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them all that you have learned of me. Lo, I am with you always. And the Bible said, as the apostles went, the Lord was walking with them, confirming his words with signs and with wonders following. So if you want to see the hand of God, then you must come under the mighty hand of the Holy Ghost through obedience. Moses did not part the Red Sea because he felt like parting the Red Sea. Moses parted the Red Sea because he was leading a people God asked him to lead. The Red Sea became a stumbling block. So the power of God had to go forth. So the Red Sea was parted because there was a man on the path of obedience. Not because there was a superstar. In fact, when Moses confronted the Red Sea, fear hit him like every one of us. He turned to God and God said, why do you turn to me? Go forward. Stretch forth thy rod and part the Red Sea. When Moses stretched forth his rod... There was something that happened in the supernatural realm. Because in obedience, we partner with the divine. As Moses stretched forth the rod, the Bible told us through prophetic insight later that the Red Sea was parted with a blast of his nostrils. It was a blast of God's nostrils that parted the Red Sea. And that was because Moses, through obedience, had partnered with the mortars. It is obedience that brings you to a place of partnership with the mortars. You don't see spirits. You only see spirits when they are revealed. But you can walk with spirit. The only way you walk with spirit is through the corridor of obedience. He said, are they not ministering spirits sent to minister for us who shall be heirs of salvation? What are they ministering for? When you walk the works of God. A lot of us young people, we desire to see a whole lot of things in our lives. People talk about word of knowledge. People meet me every day and say, how do I enter the word of knowledge? How do I grow in the word of knowledge? I say, how many persons have you won to the kingdom this year? Say, eh, two people. What do you need the word of knowledge for? What do you need the word of knowledge for? These are supposed to be tools to help you in evangelism. Is it a show? You don't have the body for evangelism. You don't have a body for lost souls. But you want word of knowledge. To do what? So that you go and start in the market and say there's somebody here. I am a prophet. What is it for? What do you think spiritual things are? Every spiritual gift is as deep as the Holy Ghost. 
Because the Bible calls every spiritual gift a manifestation of the Spirit. It's as deep as the Holy Spirit. Its essence is as significant as the person that gives it. And that's why it is manifested by His will and according to His will. It is in obedience that men become mighty. That's why every time God wants to make a man, he breaks him first through process. Because when that man comes to a point where he becomes pliable in the hands of the Holy Ghost, he becomes an extension of the hand of God. So every time God wants to operate, that man becomes the tool God uses. You are a battle axe in the hands of God. It is obedience that makes men to become men of wonder. Because their life has been buried on the altar of sacrifice. All of the men, the heroes of faith we saw, they obeyed God at one point or the other. Their lives was an expression of obedience at different levels, at different degrees and at different generations. So the burdens that should hit our heart is not how to become great in God. These guys never had greatness in view. They never had greatness in view. They were swallowed up with a zeal to do the will of God. And they found out that they were mighty men later. They never had greatness in view. People like Daniel, the Bible said, they refused to defy themselves with the king's meat. Is it not supposed to be a privilege that you are in captivity and they select four of you and say, come and work for the king and with the king? They said they will not defy themselves. They saw it as defilement. And Daniel began to grow. He began to grow. There was no story of Daniel until they showed up in captivity. Until Daniel chose to obey God, there was no mention of Daniel. He would never have been relevant. Hope you know that in that same captivity, there were men whose destiny were bigger than Daniel. If you study the genealogy of Jesus Christ, during that captivity, there were people who were in captivity who carried the seed of Jesus Christ in captivity. They died. They only transferred it to the next generation. There was no mention of them until we saw the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But for Daniel to manifest, it was because he chose the pathway of obedience. A point came where Daniel was equated to a God. When the king needed somebody to interpret the hand, the wife said, this was the testimony of a hidden, an outcast. He said, there is one Daniel in whom the spirit of the Holy Ghost dwells. There is one Daniel. The testimony of Daniel was that the spirit of the Holy Ghost dwelt in him. He had grown to that stature. He had gotten that stature, that capacity, that ranking in God. He could be equated with the waters. He said, light and excellent spirit is found in this Daniel. And when Daniel showed up, the king said to him, he said he has called all the astrologers. All the wise men, the diviners. He said, nobody could give interpretation. He said, give me the interpretation to this thing. And he said, I will make you great. He said, a gold chain will build on you and a, a purple scarlet will be worn you. You will become the third in command in the whole of the realm. Daniel said, keep your gift with you. That's a man who is dead to the lust of the flesh. What powers him? What pushes him? What propels him forward? Is the will of the father. He said, keep your gift with you. He said, but I will show you in the interpretation. He said, this is what is written. Mene, mene. Take care of a sin. And he began to interpret. You have been weighed. He took that. You know, what amazed me in that scripture is that Daniel took time to explain everything that happened even though he was not there. How did he know it? His mind is now fused with God. Say, your father Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord raised him, he became mighty until his heart was lifted up. And God had to send him to live among the beasts. His heart became the heart of an animal. He said, God raised you too. He said, you defied the vessels of God and you gave praises to the God of iron, of silver, of gold and of stone whom has no life in them and you did not glorify the living God. He said, therefore, this is the handwriting on the wall. Mene, mene. He said, you have been gathered. You have been weighed on the balances and you have been found wanting. He said, therefore, your kingdom will be divided among the medics and the patients. That night, 
he lost the kingdom. Because there is a man of obedience. Every man of obedience is an immortal entity. Because through obedience, what happens is that we become an extension of God. God speaks through us. God walks through us. So even when we are gone from this time, our posterity lives for many generations. Peter was talking, he said, I will keep you, I will have you to keep these things in remembrance. Even while I have diseased, he said, keep these things in remembrance. What was Peter saying? This thing that he has come to believe is more important than his life. He didn't say, remember me. There was nothing. His stature meant nothing to him. It didn't mean anything to him. He said, when I'm dead, when I'm gone, he said, remember these things. He said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we brought to you the testimony of the power of God and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, for we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What consumed his passion was to please him that is king. We were eyewitnesses. What is that thing that appealed to you the most? What is that thing that has become a God in your life? Because the way we are designed is that we must be obedient to something. Because we are designed to be filled. Man is created with a vacuum. Some of us, it is fashion. So when we have need for something, we can't sleep. We will run round the clock until that thing is achieved. What you are obedient to becomes your God. That's what you have not realized. And the problem is that the extent of exploit you will have in this life is dependent on the God that you serve. Because they that know their God, they shall be strong and do exploit. If your God is fashion, then it is only the things that fashion can address that you can have in your life. If your God is money, you will be obedient to money. And it is only the things that money can achieve and provide that you can have in life. If your God is a man, it is only the things that that man can achieve that you will have in your life. Because the extent of exploit you will have is, so, is tantamount to the capacity of that man. What has become the God in your life? Obedience is the key. We have needs, we have problems. But we need, we need the revelation of the resurrection. And when we have had the revelation of the resurrection, we need total submission to Jesus as Lord. That is when the kingdom begins to live through you. The kingdom is the governing influence of a king over a people. Making a citizenry out of them. Such that will reflect his will, his essence and his purpose. What do you reflect from your life? It speaks of what you are submitted to. It is time to examine our hearts. It is time to check our heart. And ask the Lord to help us. Ask the Lord to help us. Because there is a challenge with our generation. And if there is anybody that will bring the change, it is you and I. The Bible says we should not tell God that resurrected to come back to her or to come back to the world. Jesus won't come back to sort the problem again. When he comes back, he's to wrap up, wrap up the whole universe and bring a new dispensation. The people that can make a difference is you and I. And Paul said, according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. We, having the same spirit of faith, believe and therefore speak. What is your life projecting? You may think there is time. That's the deception of the devil. The Bible says man is like the flowers of a rose that withers away. It is there in the morning before evening is gone. The flower blows up until in a twinkle of an eye it falls down. And you begin to wonder what is the flower that was blossoming a while ago? That's how life is. It blows on like a rose. And before you know what is happening, it's no more. But it is a ticket God has given to us in order to procure a reward for ourselves in the world to come. Apostle told us here, he said, our life is a story that God is telling from heaven. Will you let God tell that story through you? That's the question tonight. By the time the revelation of the resurrection comes to you and you obey God 
There is no way you will not end up a mighty person on earth. It's not possible. You cannot be conquered. But beyond that, God has a goal. God has a purpose. God has a will that your life is supposed to reflect. Will you give him a chance to have it? In salvation, we receive all from God. In the kingdom, we give all back to God. What is God receiving on account of your life? Will you live in this world only for what you want and what you need until the day you depart? Do you think life is just the breath on your nostril? It is deeper than that. God invested himself in you because God wants to live out through you. Why won't you give him a chance? Why would you give him a chance? Even the day you will die, you will have a need. So need is not the emphasis. The very day you will die, you will have a need. That's how people have death wishes. It doesn't end. But by the time your pilgrimage and your sojourning is done in time, there is him that will ferry you through the, the dark divide of the immortal realm into the realm of light. That being is called the Holy Ghost. And he's knocking on your door day and night to give him a room for expression. But you have chased him away on account of your need. The day you have the greatest need is the day your soul needs to be ferried from time into immortality. That day you will need the Holy Spirit. Would you wait until that day so that when you are leaving this world, instead of living with joy, you will live with uncertainty? Jesus gave us the... the the, 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 the pattern of living this world it is finished, that's the pattern God should have achieved his purpose completely in your life then you give up the ghost the Bible spoke of the men of old when they are due to leave this world, they gather their children and they bless them when they bless them, the Bible said Joseph packed his feet and kept on the bed and he rested that's how to die they are not taking on a worse. They walk with God until when they come to an end of their life. They are aware that there is nothing more to do. Then like Simeon, they say they will depart in peace. Life is finished. There is nothing on this side. Life is going to be lived when the new dispensation appears in Zion. That is when life is going to be lived. This world has been corrupted. This world is suffering mutation and corruption. There is no good in this world anymore. We are here because we are supposed to be agencies through which God transforms this world and brings those who are numbered for salvation. If you think there is pleasure here, you have missed it. Pleasure is in Zion. That is the land where there is no tears. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. True pleasure is born from the spirit. What we have here, they are strategies of the demonic realm to appeal to the lust of the eyes, to the lust of the flesh and to the pride of life. They are designed to shift you away from God so that your allegiance goes back to the devil. You who has salvation raging on your inside should be called the child of a devil. It is a, it's, it's an abomination. It is like the prince of this world sitting in the tabernacle. It is called the abomination of desolation. You who is supposed to become a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the devil walking through you and using you like a puppet. You don't understand who you are. You are supposed to be an extension of God. Your life is supposed to be an opening of heaven. So that when people want to look into heaven, your life becomes a window through which heaven can be discerned. When men look at you, Jesus should be revealed. That's the only thing you live for. That's the only reality that is true in your life. Even yourself is a lie. That's why you don't have the shape you have now when you were two years old. Because even your very expression is a lie. By the time you grow past this age, even this shape will change. A time will come when your beautiful face that was your God will become sagging. And your face will lose value. Because yourself is a lie. The only true thing that is in you is Jesus. And that Jesus wants to rage. That Jesus wants to be seen. He wants to be manifested. Why do you keep hindering him? Don't wait like Jacob until your tie is broken. There's a life. Is raging from the inside. You don't need anybody to teach you. The Bible says you have that anointing in you. It teaches you all things. That is the life that tells you to fast. When you lied, that is the life that shook on your inside and you lost your peace. That life is going to be the tool that will save you from destruction. Apostle said sometimes 
the difference between life and death is a whisper. That life rages. It rages on your inside. Will you give him a chance? God has not called you to use your resources. That's why we have eternal life. When we receive the resurrection, what was imparted was eternal life. That is the tool you need to achieve it. You don't need to be strong. I told them in Kaba three days ago. I said Catherine Kuma was a weak woman. She was ugly. She didn't have a man to love her. She poured her affections on God. And until the end of time, she is a memorial. Her life has become a witness to the hidden power of God. She is a female apostle that reflected Jesus in the brightest colors. Because beauty is not what we see in the external. Beauty is the, is the aroma of God that flows out of a man. That is true beauty. What is flowing out of you? What is flowing? What is flowing out of you? Beauty is not... The true definition of holiness is being separated unto God. But in the original root word, it is called beauty. When you are separated unto God, that dimension of God that flows through you. So when we look at men, we are supposed to see different layers of God. When I look at this brother, I'm supposed to see a strange dimension of God. And I marvel. I look at my sister, I see another dimension of God. Then we complete ourselves in beauty and in glory. That's, that's, that's the expression of the angelic realm. When you look at the angelic realm, you see different manifestations of God. So when you saw Lucifer, he had musical instruments. He was a reflection of the musical dimension of God. So if he moved, he produced sound. When you are looking at him and you are marveling, who is this? Then you see Michael. Michael shows up like a weapon of war. He shows up in might and in power. Then you begin to wonder, who is this? Then Gabriel shows up. And then as he's coming, mystery flows. Different communication. That's how the angelic realm is. When you come into the body of Christ, what you are supposed to see is different flavors of God. When one is talking, you see peace. When one is talking, you see love. When one is talking, you see humility. When one is talking, you see kindness. Every time we lift our voices and sing, the Bible said it is grace mingling. Grace mingling. So when you are talking, the layer that I don't have, I touch it. When she is talking, maybe I don't have the prophetic, but because she's the one praying, my eyes open in the spirit. Because she has opened a window of the prophetic. So through her, I can see in the spirit. When he's talking, I don't have the healing power, but because he spoke into my life, when I go out and lay hands on somebody, the healing power flows. Because we are different extensions of God. We are different manifestations of God. We are different realities of God. Every time we choose the word, Apart from God, what we have done is that we have truncated the protocol of the divine. And what we have done is that we have robbed ourselves of a placement in the immortal realm where things matter. Every time we refuse God from manifesting to our life, we have lost. God has not lost. His name is called, I am that I am. He doesn't need anything to be added to him to be God. He is God before the world began. And even when every story about creation ends, he is still going to be God. No one knew him. Even eternity is factored in him. He is the one that contains eternity. And he can remove eternity from himself. And he will still be God. He's not limited by anything. We depend on him for survival. We depend on him for glory. The gateway is obedience to the Holy Ghost. What layer of your life? What realm of your life? What region of your life? Have you constantly rebelled against the Holy Ghost? Tonight is a call to submission. You have struggled for long. I call you on to submission tonight. I was ministering and the girl was struggling. When the power of God was moving, she was struggling. She wanted God to touch her. And I saw her at the back. And I went to her and said, Don't struggle. Yield. Just yield. And if you don't know how to yield, just let yourself and tell him to touch you. And when the power of God came on her, I ministered in the power of God for more than one hour, 30 minutes. After the meeting, I counseled for 40 minutes. And when the whole hall was empty, she was still in the hall crying. The power that came on her soul was so strong. She wanted to achieve it by her will so that she would say she did it. But what God wanted to do was for her to submit so he would do it through her. It is when God does it that he takes the glory. We have been trying to do a lot of things so that we will take the glory. That's why it's not working. I call you to obedience. Can you yield yourself tonight for a few minutes? Let God begin to break the yoke. If you can stand, rise up to your feet. 
Let God begin to break the yoke. The bondages that you have struggled with for many years. With a snap of his finger, that bondage can give way. As mighty as the Red Sea was, all it needed to part was a blast of his nostrils. God doesn't need to do so much for a change in your life. Can you just yield tonight? Can you talk to the Lord and tell him to touch you? Let's be all standing and give glory to his name. He is the monarch of Zion. He's the mighty one in battle. His name is called Yeshua and Messiah. He's the custodian of salvation. He gives it to everyone freely as he wills. He's called the God of war, Jehovah Sabaoth. He can contend with the darkness of your life. If only you will give him a chance. That thing you have battled with for many years is because those things are from the spirit and you need a spirit to help you for engagement. He is Yeshua Sabaoth, the God of war. If you can give him half a chance, there will be a change beyond what your mind can ever imagine. There's a power at work on our inside. That power can change. It can heal. It can save. I will praise. I will sing the songs of Zion to your name. I will sing. I will praise. I will sing the songs of Zion to your name. I will sing. I will praise. I will praise. I will sing songs of Zion to your name. I will sing. I will praise. I will sing the songs of Zion. I will sing the songs of Zion. Go ahead and speak in other tongues. Go ahead and speak in other tongues. Hey, hey. I will praise. already touching people. Just close your eyes and lift your hands toward heaven. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Ghost.
Just wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. The preacher has nothing to offer you. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. You see the power of God. The power of God will soon break out. It will soon break out everywhere. Wait for the Lord. Can you wait? Can you wait? Aha. Like a river. Wait for the Lord. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Touch your people. 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 in the spirit. Something is brooding in the spirit. By the river Oh, we wait Let me lay hands on them. Anybody under the power of the We wait to give your voice touch people now. There's a work God wants to do in the life of people. Just be quiet now. Be quiet now. Be quiet now. Only the keyboard. Just be quiet. Precious Holy Ghost. I ask that you place your hands on your people. Place your hands on your people now, Lord. Place your hands on your people now, Lord. Touch. Holy Ghost, touch. Touch. Let yokes begin to break. 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 Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Move. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Move now, Lord. Touch. 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 I break resistance. I break yokes. I break chains of darkness. Chains of addiction. I uproot implantations of the devil. Touch Holy Ghost. Touch Holy Ghost. Touch Holy Ghost. Let's be quiet. Let's be quiet. Let's be quiet. If you can't be quiet, be quiet for a moment. Let the wind of the Holy Ghost blow over the congregation. If you can, apart from those under the power, if you can, if you can, just be quiet for a moment. Let the wind of the Holy Ghost blow over the congregation. That's right. 
That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. The intensity is increasing. The intensity is increasing. The intensity is increasing. Ushers, please be sensitive. Let nobody be injured. The intensity is increasing. The intensity is increasing. You don't have to, they don't have to break the chairs before you get them. Just guide them carefully. Nobody should be injured. The intensity is increasing. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bring the people under the power. Let me place hand on them. The Holy Ghost is still working on people. He's working on the heart of men for now. Strongholds of the soul are broke, are being broken. What God really wants to do today is to heal the sick. But strongholds, strongholds are being broken in the heart of men. Strongholds are being broken. Tonight the Lord will heal the sick. But he's, doing, he's dealing with heart matters for now. Heart matters. Just stay connected. Refuse to be distracted. Refuse to be distracted. Refuse to be distracted. Hit her with the hand on the head. Refuse to be distracted. Refuse to be distracted. Refuse to be distracted. God is hardly heart, heart issues, heart issues. Strongholds, strongholds of the heart have been broken. Strongholds of the heart. Strongholds, those things that keep you away from God. They have been broken, they have been broken. The things that keep you away from the presence. They have been broken, they have been broken. That's what matters to God the most. Those things that keep you away from God. They have been broken. They have been broken. They have been broken. Strongholds, strongholds, strongholds. They are called strongholds because they are difficult to break. But the Holy Ghost is brooding. Those things have been broken. They are giving way. Just stay focused on God. Stay focused on God. Stay focused on God. Stay focused on God. We are giving the Holy Ghost time to do His work. Sabarabababonasilakata. Resoto brenega sila bundo ruba kabapuri atakabas rahabali kundo subrahali kabapundo rubu bukuri atalabata rasito burus kabila bundo barakaninas beresete kom brenega sula bahaska rahibundo se brenega balababa burias rika pata ko brenega sundo rahivrundo si brakata bundo rubu bukuri rezino palagata rashabda glesko brenegila mande. Indo zagi bara sendro beragidas rapata kabundo subrahaste lega sabela kaboranda brasundo preskebiro rapira bara zindo enso braktekira bara da bundo lega basata bara baba boratila bara baba baboras rapata kabata bara baba bunde repina sundra bara diga reso frakte pradege sundo marakido sobre nata ela konde sabila graska bara baga da bunda Rabba batego solo bundo e rabando bresca baradiga libranta se predegizo rabba baba dundo soblega di la baradina sanda rashabda glafetto brega da bina rapata kabada bunda
in Jesus name in Jesus name see the Holy Ghost wants to heal I see a woman here pay attention please see a woman here you have a call of God on your life before you got married please pay attention peace in the name of Jesus before you got married the Lord spoke to you that he was going to use you as an evangelist in fact you have prayed for the sick and they got healed instantly but you see when you got married it became impossible for you to do the works of God and right now the witness of God in your heart is that that grace that God put on your life is transferred to your son. But the reason I want to pray for you is that you are sick. You are sick. You are sick. And right now your life is threatened and you are afraid. I want to cast the spirit of fear away from you so that you can have your peace. Is that person here? Come. You are sick. And the spirit of fear have arrested you. Spirit of fear have arrested you. Mama. Can you please help us lay hands on them? They are women. See, this thing is not an emotional thing. It's God that touches people. Although it impacts on your emotions and overwhelms you, but it's deeper than emotion. Let your heart be focused on Jesus. to the Lord in the privacy of your heart. We are supposed to close before six. I don't know how we have gotten to this place already. sick, just place your hands there. Let me pray for you generally. If you are sick, just place your hands there. Just place your hands there. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, thank you for your, for your loving kindness. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you, Lord, for that which you have procured for us the ground of grace. Right now, Lord, we lay hold on it. And by the power of the resurrected Christ, I rebuke the spirit of infirmity. I rebuke the spirit of infirmity. I charge you in the name of Jesus. Go out of them. Leave them in the name of Jesus. Yokes of sickness, chains of infirmity, be broken in the name of Jesus. Every demon transporting sickness to your bodies. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Out of them right now. Out of them now. Let the bondage of sickness be broken and ended in Jesus precious name. Give the Lord the, the shout. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The atmosphere is already very charged. 
And um, I know a lot of us will be carried by the Spirit to a point where God Himself will instruct us by Himself and by His Spirit. We will begin from the earth realm and gradually as we migrate into Zion, every one of us will see Him as He is. That's the reason we gather together. Not to see men, not to hear novel speeches, but that by all means we will access the presence of the Father. The Bible says times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Father. Just lift your hands toward heaven. The time has come. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit. We look up to you tonight for strength, for wisdom, and for access. We ask that, oh God, by all means, we will be carried by the wings of your spirit into the hallowed places, the depths in Zion where secrets are locked, the places where you took the patriarchs of old and they cut covenant with you that sustained an eternal stature. Covenants that even the coming of Jesus did not end, but energized the same dimensions that we walk in today and bear witness to your great name. Carry us to those places in the spirit. Let our worship of you not be reduced to religion. But let it be life indeed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. I will teach for 25 minutes. And then after my short exhortation, we will pray for 10 minutes. So I will touch the pillars that the devil have installed in your life that have made it impossible for you to advance in the direction of your calling. I was in Lasso yesterday. There are dimensions in God and when you catch a dimension, you don't struggle to manifest it. It's a piquita on the strength of your intimacy. By the time I'm rounding up, fire will be littered in this place. Fire. You know, they sent me a message this afternoon. Some people have been praying for the past 48 hours. They've not been able to stop. Fire will be littered. Some of you will touch the coals of fire. The worst thing that will happen to you is to reduce something that sustains an immortal stature into a mundane reality. And you interact with it at the frequency of your mind. Everything we come to do in God's presence has its root in Zion. And until we can travel to Zion and touch the foundation of those things, we will abuse them in time. This is why many times when God begins a revival, He doesn't necessarily come to teach people. You know, there's a wave of knowledge. So everybody talks big things. But the people that are established in revival are those that have traveled into the archive of heaven and they have seen the signature of God concerning their destiny. That is what will happen to many of you here this evening. You will travel to Zion and you will see what was written concerning you before the foundations of the world. In matters of destiny, creativity is not a guarantee. You are not permitted to be creative. Because everything you are supposed to do has already been outlined. You are only as permitted to be yielded. And the degree to which your yieldedness affords you insight into the things that God sculpted by that finger of fire is what will determine your value in time. We are in a transition season. The subject is the carriage of the spirit. There are seven blocks that I have discovered in scriptures that makes for the ability to carry the spirit of God in a very heightened intensity. Seven blocks that I have found out. This evening we will look at one and we'll pray. It's very important for you to understand that locked up in the flesh, you cannot fulfill the will of God. Neither can you execute any divine agenda unless a spirit comes upon you. 
the spirit of God is that essence of God in whom the, the will, the mandate, and the dimensions of God are couched. Every time a dimension is unveiled, that dimension is not just a manifestation that is born out of the intelligence or creativity of the mortar through which that dimension is manifested. Every time you see a dimension of God manifested through a mortar vessel, it is the spirit of God released in that flavor. So men vitally through the powers of alignment become conduit pipes through which the essence of God is mirrored. So when you see a man carry a spirit or the manifestation of healing, it is not a skill demonstrated by a man. If you don't understand that healing is a dimension of God that is locked up in the archive of heaven and only the Holy Ghost have access to that archive and it is the carriage of the spirit that necessitates for the flow of the healing virtue through that man. You will look at the man demonstrate healing effortlessly and you might think what he's doing is a show. So because you see him on white suit, you will go and buy your own white suit. And then every step that man took, you will take the same step. And you will alter your voice the way the man altered his voice. Until your results prove that what you are doing is mundane. And the essence of what you are doing cannot travel into heaven. So your results will be completely different from his result. You can speak like that man. But like the sons of Skiva, your circumstance will reveal to you the futility of the actions you are carrying out. Because both demons and your circumstance understand the language of heaven. So when you utter your voice, your circumstance will tell you you have lied. The only thing that has the power to change the position that we have put you is a voice that comes from heaven. And only the carriage of the spirit can bring that whisper of God in whom the powers that hold the foundation of creation together dwells. So you can see a poor person and you say, no, from today you will prosper. Nothing will shake. You can be living in sin and then you wake up on the 1st of January and say, I will not sin again. On then, on the 1st of January by 12 o'clock, you have sinned 10 times. So you will now discover that your circumstance don't hear your voice. Your circumstance only have an ear that hears the echoes of Zion. You may see somebody sick and because Pastor Chris said, be healed in the name of Jesus. You now come and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. The sickness will tell you, you are a joker. It's not the intonation that carry the power. It is what? The carriage of the spirit. Healing is a dimension in Jesus. And only men that carry the spirit can communicate it. So any dimension the Holy Ghost chooses to manifest through you, then you yield to that dimension. And that dimension begins to flow through you. So at best, you are a conduit pipe. That's why you don't deserve credit for anything you do. The Bible said, this treasure is hid in 18 verses. So that the excellency will be of God and not of man. I know a lot of people. See the way my can say Cindy. I was with my friend Lord and saw your last last year around December. And then I went to UI actually for their JCCF conference and I was admonishing them. Because you are here, don't let all of you not start chanting. You know, because <laughs> it's not no 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 no. The power the power is not in the harmony. The power is something the man has taught something in heaven. I want to show us something this evening so that you will not do trial and error with your life. I am a chemist by training. I am a, so I understand the danger of experiment. The danger of experiment is that you have only one chance. That sample you are using for that experiment, whether you get it or you fail it, you have what? One chance. That sample will waste after the experiment. Either it produces the result or it is wasted. Meanwhile, you have only one life. So if you do experiment with it, if you don't get it, at the end of your life, it would have been wasted. So you cannot afford an experiment with your life. You need to go back to the ancient parts and find out how the patriarchs of old, what did they know, what did they touch, and what did they see that gave them so much rank in heaven that they come to territories and they say, before God do my stand, there shall be no rain or dew. And the person leaves and locks the gate of heaven. Meanwhile, there are 7,000 intercessors who are praying in that land and there's no rain. What did these men know? Before you carry yourself to a place and say, Every principality in my father's house, I bind you. Every time the spirit of God is released into a generation, there are three major things that it brings. The first thing it brings is wisdom. The second thing it brings is power. 
The third thing he brings is the essence or the nature of God, which is law, holiness, and righteousness. There is no dispensation of God that these three things will be lacking. So when we speak about the carriage of the Spirit, there are three things to look out for in the life of people that truly carry the Spirit. What I want to share with us this evening is actually one of the pillars upon which the carriage of the Spirit rests. But I need to show you the indicators that characterizes the carriage of the Spirit. Because if you don't see these indicators in the man, see, suit don't make the carriage of the Spirit. It's good for us to dress modestly because the assignment we are carrying out is an assignment of a king. But you see, our packaging is not what the carriage of the Spirit is about. The way we talk is not what the carriage of the Spirit constitutes. You need to understand the things that eternal relevance are anchored upon. And just in case a spirit appears in the territory, the things that spirit will look at, that will determine whether a man is in alignment with God or not. Those are the things that are proofs that a man carries the spirit. And until you understand these things, you cannot benchmark the dimensions of God that your life should reference. Three things. One is wisdom. And wisdom primarily is for direction and for beauty. The Bible said, true wisdom is an house built dead. By understanding, it is established. And by knowledge, the chambers are filled. So the move of God can never be established in a dispensation that is oblivious to matters of wisdom. That is why every move of God must of necessity be characterized by the wisdom that comes from God. So when you see a man that has the carriage of the spirit, there must be something working in his life that is beyond his learning. The fishermen came all of a sudden and they began to speak. And they looked at them and they marveled, knowing that these men were unlearned men. How come they have access to so much wisdom that they will utter their voices? And even the Sanhedrin, which were the doctors of the laws, the custodian of knowledge in that generation, were left in oblivion at the utterance of this man. There was a wisdom that was ageless working in their lives. And that is why the move of God is not dependent on your age. You can be a kid. It doesn't matter. You can be an adult. It doesn't matter. You can be old. It doesn't matter. You can be rich. You can be poor. Your natural proclivities, tendencies, and limitations are not a factor. When that wisdom comes, that wisdom is an impregnated reality of a spirit that is ancient. So when you speak, you are echoing a voice that comes from eternity past and that voice is going into eternity future. You are only a conduit pipe in your dispensation through which that voice is passing. But if that wisdom is not at work in you, you are not a carrier of the spirit. The carriage of the spirit is indicated by the quality of wisdom that is at work in your life. The second dimension that reveals the carriage of the spirit is the power of God. In Acts chapter 10 verse 38, the Bible said how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good healing all them that were oppressed of the devil so what power comes to do is to challenge the kingdom that is in existence before this dimension of God wants to appear because you know the thing with civilization is that civilization is not a culture of a people so to say cultures are a revelation of the predominant civilization but civilization are actually a revelation of the predominant spirit in the territory you can have 30 churches on your campus here. But if we come to this campus, the civilization that we will know, or the spirit that we will know has authority in this campus, will not be the building that we see. It will be the lifestyle of the people. Because the culture of the people in this territory is revelatory of the spirit that sustains authority in this region. And the last time I checked on your campus, I saw that more than 70% of the young ladies dressed naked. So without word of knowledge or discernment of spirit, I know that the spirit that rule in the regions of Babylon have a, a throne in BSU. So the predominant civilization here is what? A spirit of immorality. So if the move of God come and men truly carry spirit, it's not go, poo, 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 at the back of a building. When the move of God come and carriage of the spirit become predominant, that dimension will be shifted away. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. Every dimension that is characteristic of the Spirit apart from God, the carriage of the Spirit challenges it. Because it's a matter of kingdom. It's a matter of government. It's a matter of dominion. Without kingdom and government, the will of God can never find expression. You can know you are born a prophet, but if you are under that civilization of immorality, what it will do is that it will choke the distance of your eye. 
you will have a, an awareness that you are born a prophet. In fact, at the age of seven, you saw Jesus Christ. At the age of twelve, you saw open vision. You could decide what is happening. But when you came to twenty-one, when you should fulfill your destiny, then the civilization cripples you. When you were a child and you didn't understand the value of your calling, that time you were seeing vision. Now you are ready to do ministry, but you have come under the web of a civilization. Every young lady you look, you, your lust rises on your inside, and that lust is an energy for a, from a demon. That energy will never allow you to see visions that will bring you into the fullness of your prophetic call. What has happened to you is that you are under the bondage of a devil, and every time you encounter a man that is a carrier of the spirit, you may not fall under the anointing, but something will happen to you. The powers of lust will die. The powers of sickness will die. The powers of affliction will die. The carriage of the spirit comes to establish the dimension of the kingdom. And the third dimension is the spirit of God. The essence of God. Holiness, righteousness and law. In Acts chapter 2 from verse 37, the Bible spoke how that Peter, he said, after Peter spake, their hearts were pricked. That's a man that carries the spirit. Their hearts were pricked. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter told them to repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Suddenly, 3,000 persons joined themselves to the church because a man spoke. That's a carrier of the spirit. Nobody fell down, but 3,000 repented. Acts chapter 5 verse 17, he spoke again. 5,000 joined the church. Acts chapter 6, from verse 7, the Bible said a company of the priests, those are beggars, religious devout. Do you, have you seen religious people before? Somebody is fornicating, it's not a problem. But when you talk about church, you say, no, my church, we, we are fornication is not a problem, but church, he will hold his church like this. He's a religious man. He doesn't know God. The culture of his spirit is not his reality. God is not fabricated into him. What happened to him is that he grew up with people that were religious men. So their bias was towards their church, not towards Christ. So he sustained that bias. And that bias became the ultimate revelation of his conviction and his prowess in the spirit. Meanwhile, he's not even touching the ceiling of his room. Nobody knows him in heaven. He doesn't have popularity among the mortars. Just in case a census is carried out in the territory, his name will not be found. Because he's in church, he's not in the spirit. Did you not read about Adam? Adam was still in the garden, but the God came and he said, Adam, Adam, where are thou? Was God blind? No, God is not blind. Adam was sitting on the throne in the spirit realm. He has fallen. So he was still in church, but his throne was vacant. So when God came, God was interacting with him at an energy level. He could no longer be factored in that energy level. He was still in a physical location, but he didn't know that that physical location was a doorway to heaven. So he was enjoying it then. He thought he was in church. He was pastor. He was prophet. But he was no longer in the spirit. Powers of religion. In Acts chapter 6 verse 7. He said a great company of the, of the priests became obedient. A man that carries the spirit was talking. And in Acts chapter 13 verse 44. The Bible said the whole city. If 10 men that carry the spirit enter this campus. You will be amazed. For the first time. You will see 10,000 students gather. You will say, what is happening? They say, we are going to pray. Ah. When have 10,000 people started praying, it is the spirit that is emitting. That's what happened in the days of revival. The Bible spoke, history told us of Evan Roberts. The guy was not an erod erodite preacher. He only came and sat in church. And every time he sits down, he begins to cry. And as he begins to cry, there is a ripple effect that leaves the church into the streets. And bankers begin to come there. Policemen begin to come there. In the year of his revival, even FIFA could not hold FIFA World Cup. So when you see the history of FIFA World Cup, when they come to when it will be held in Wales, they say revival. So they shifted it. Even the governments of the day, they will recognize it. A student here that carries the spirit can hold prayer meeting and your VC will come and pack his car. You know why? He will come because he knows that professorial ranking is nothing in the spirit. Because you can talk in the spirit and you will be giving expression to the voice of a spirit that has lived for ageless aeon. What he studied is a mundane knowledge that was captured and articulated in writings in few years before he was born. But when you alter your voice by a spirit, it was the one that stood in eternity and created the foundation of the earth. 
It is by his wisdom that he speaks. Where was he standing when the earth was not yet created? So you cannot even factor the origin of that wisdom because that wisdom came from outside time. Into time and is going outside of time. Time is only a pathway that that wisdom wants to navigate in order to create a company of people that can enjoy fellowship with the divine. Righteousness, the proof of the carriage of the spirit. When you see people that carry the spirit, forget the packaging. Packaging is important at some point because modesty is required. The Bible says, make garments unto error for beauty and for glory. But the garment is not the priesthood. The priesthood is the business in the Holy of Holies. Carry it. So, with these indicators I'm giving you, look around. You will see the need why all of us should cry. Have you seen anybody here that has the courage of the Spirit? That's why we will cry in a short while. We are churchgoers. We are leaders in church, but we don't carry the Spirit. Your friend is your friend, but she goes for nightclub comfortably. The reason is not, the fault is not hers, it's yours. You talk about Jesus, but you can't represent him. The day you carry the spirit, your friend will say, I want to follow you to where you pray. It's contagious. When you enter there, the energy comes out with you. Have you not noticed what we do is in church? You come to church, you say, Holy Ghost, move! Hundred people fall down. You go to the market, nobody notices you are passing. And you say, oh boy, the power of God, where they walk on now, no be small. You are you are nice to yourself and it's very loud. The angels will look at you and marvel. Who is he talking to? They will say Jesus. So men deceive themselves. Every time you come here, he will show your operating system. You can be active on earth, but that fire has one technology weaved into it from eternity past, is to show you your operating system. When John ascended there, there were churches doing exploit on earth. He now saw Jesus walking in the midst of the lampstands. And Jesus began to x-ray the churches because that's what the course of fire does. He shows you your operating system. If your operating system is wrong, you can't do service for God on earth. That spirit is an ancient spirit. The monarch of Zion, the eternal one. The Bible says that where he sits, no man can approach because of the blazing holiness. The church in Philadelphia, the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was a church of gift, wisdom and depth. The Bible said they proved the apostles. That means if you came to Ephesus, they will show you all the doctrine and tell you their foundation, their roots and their origin. But when Jesus looked at them, the ghost of fire deciphered them. He said, you have proven the apostles. You have done mighty things, but I have wanted against you. You have lost your first love. Because you have lost your first love, I will come quickly and I will remove your candle. So you can be 10,000 on earth, but in heaven, only one man that is accurate can be heavier in the spirit than a church of 10,000. This is where competition dies. This is where ambition dies. Because the people that mark the scorecard in heaven, the values they consider are not earthly values, they are heavenly values. The reason you can give up your virginity for an A is because you have not seen the market scheme of heaven. You are only aware of the market scheme in the department of psychology. The next time you want to give up your virginity, go and ask heaven first, what is, how do you mark in heaven? That's when they will tell you, holiness is hundred. You now say, how about beauty? How about skill? How about excellence? You will see zero, zero, zero. Because if you fail one, you have failed all. So they don't need to create all. If you fail one, you have failed all. Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. See, this is why we sing songs. Rain, rain in my life, rain. I checked myself in the mirror of the spirit last night. I discovered pride was there. So I come, I say, rain, rain, rain. My preaching is a waste until this pride is dealt with. So I say, rain. I can sing one song for three years. It's not about how many you are singing. It's the revelation you have caught from that song that you sing. So I say, rain. I saw pride. I saw arrogance. I saw lust. Rain, rain. Because the last time I checked, the Bible said the voice of God thundered. The voice of God divided the flames of fire. The voice of God discovered the forest. The voice of God, it causes the hind to carve. The voice can pierce through the borders of my heart. He knows the borderlines of my soul. I can hide it from my friend. I can hide it from my brother. But there's no way I can hide it from him. His name is called Alpha Omega. Before I was created, he saw my end. So he knows the path. I come to him, I say, Ray, 
Ray, Ray, Ray. That's where Christianity begins from. It begins from death. Paul said we are the circumcision that worships God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. I have checked the parameters. I am a lawyer. I'm wiser than everybody in my age. But when I check the scorecard of heaven, the spirit of God is not interested in my intelligence. The spirit of God is not interested in my certificate. So I decided to count all of those things as nothing. Man, that means death are the only men that see the power of resurrection. The carriage of the spirit begins from death. Kaparasas, sevanato parani sikai, beles kavita, atalas kaparata, omete kara susua, pena katina tovalash, ariana tale kaviro sapa, ombra sate. What comment are you wearing? Some of us are wearing the comments of lust. We are wearing the comments of pride. And we want to do the business of the secret place. Budget. Kayas. Shatavia Suvash. This was the path that Jesus revealed. The Bible called him the author and the finisher of our faith. Four times Jesus revealed that death was the key to glory. The Bible said in Matthew chapter 3 verse 15. Jesus wanted to go out and start ministry. He was supposed to show up as the son of the living God. He was supposed to show up as the light of the world. He was supposed to show up as the creator. But God told him, go to Jordan and be baptized of John. Why will creator be baptized by creation? Because death must walk into his being before he can carry the weight of glory. So when he came to John, John said, no, I'm not worthy to untie the latchet of your sandal. I should be baptized of you. He said, suffer it to be so for now. That's the language of death. There's a vocabulary of death that men of glory carry. Every time they speak, their voices are fitter through the pathway of death. These patterns are consistent forever. Suffer it to be so for now. Thus, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. He died again. That is death to popularity. Everybody were expecting to see the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And then here come the Lamb of God. Men were ready to clap their hands, but the Lamb of God went and knelt down. That is death to faith. Death to popularity. Death to ego. Dimensions of death are pathways of glory. A man that understands the art of submitting to death is a man that is life will be an expression that broke us glory in every dimension. These are eternal patterns. It was carried out in the life of Jesus and everyone that will strike a chord in the annals of eternity. Such must be his experience. You have not died to faith. Who told you you can bring the gospel at the level where kings will come to you? That fame will become the tool that the devil will use against you. Death If only these words will echo in our spirit, our convictions, and our paradigms will shift. Death! What death does is that, ah, there's a search engine of the Holy Spirit. He comes and he extracts your life. He sees what the four have done to you. And then God comes and insists that he will reverse that protocol. That's what death does. Death is a reverser of the protocol of the fall. That's why all the death is embraced. Resurrection is not possible. Both of us were falling, but the impact will be lost for me. The impact will be lying for you. The requirements will be different. But death must be embraced. Death! Jesus embraced it. It was hard. But he said, suffer it to be so for now. That's why songs become incense that rises to heaven. Because every time you catch a revelation of a song and you sing it, it's an act of worship. You are surrendering again to the Lordship of the Christos. Jesus revealed death to fame and popularity as a precursor of the approval of God. A man that has not died to fame cannot be approved. The moment he died to fame, the voice of God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well placed. He didn't need John to introduce him anymore. God could no longer wait. 
The question was for John to announce Jesus. But God came by himself and announced him. Because he has seen death. The second dimension of death that Jesus revealed was death to the lust of the flesh. Three times the devil came tempted him. Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1 to 9. Three times he proved that he was a dead man. And when he came out of there, what was given to him from heaven was authority to advance ordination. The reason most of us are apostles and prophets but will be never manifest is because lost is still our cardinal operating system. The moment lost was done with, the Bible said in Matthew 4, from verse 14 to 16, he said the land of Zebul, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Death to lost is what empowers you for destiny and continuation. Death to fame is what brings the approval of God on your life. These were things Jesus was showing. Those things were not coincidences. They were written down by the prophets because those are navigatory paths that Jesus must follow. The first path to follow was to die to fame. So when his influence spread abroad, abroad, it was not a factor. The second thing to die to was the lust of the flesh. He died and he received empowerment. The third thing that Jesus died to were matters of ministerial influence. Most of us, if somebody shake you and don't bend down, it's a trouble. Because you think as you show up, everybody should lick your boots. You are a joker. The last time we checked, only God should be worshipped. But if you don't die, if you don't die to those ministerial ego, if you don't die to those ministerial hunger and requirement, that causes a lot of pastors to become manipulators. If you don't die to it, you can never have anything in time that resonates in eternity. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 31, that was when Jesus died to issue some ministerial influence, including invitations and international ministry that we fight for. He said, except the come of we fall to the ground and dies, it abided alone. Every time these things happen, God thunders from heaven. Because what it means is that the secret for greatness that is locked into the foundation of time, a man for the first time is discovering them. It thundered from heaven. The people say it was thunder. Others say it was an angel. And Jesus said it is for you that this voice has come. But they could not hear it because they were not there. Only a dead man heard that echo. There are certain voices that only dead men hear. They do not read in your Bible. He said the Son of God shall speak and they that are dead shall hear him and live. There are echoes that only dead men hear. Except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and die. He abided alone. Instantly the Father thundered from heaven. And Jesus said now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of the cosmos cast out and I if I be lifted up I will draw all men. That was where the strategy of salvation was given to him. When he died to ministerial influence. The reason most of us can never carry enough of the spirit to give back into our offices is because we are conscious of the office. You come somewhere, they didn't introduce you as apostle. And because of that, you could not manifest. You, are, you, you became weak in the service. And then for two years, every time you see that person that introduced you, you say, this boy is arrogant. Imagine this boy, he introduced me, he didn't call me an apostle. Oh, you have lost the authority of your apostleship. You have lost the authority of your apostleship. That you are conscious of it above what God is doing, you have lost it. Death to ministerial proclivities. There are different levels. As you progress in God, those dimensions will flow. It will flow. It will flow. And you will be amazed. The things that make men, certain men come and they just speak around your life and things change. I heard the story of Daddy Kumuhi. They were laboring to deliver a young man. And then when he was passing, he said, he's free. He's not, in the name of Jesus, come out, come out. And you say it five times. You think it's when you say it five times. And when they ask you, say five, represent grace. You will say five times in sets of five and nothing will happen. A man that have died came and they said, leave him, leave him, leave him, leave him. When he was saying leave him, 
The people praying thought he was talking to them. They didn't know it was the demons holding him bound he was talking to. When he said leave him, the demons heard. The fourth kind of death that Jesus died was death to his will. Listen, when God created man, he gave man his will. He gave man the right to choose. That's the greatest power God gave to man. But listen, this is what worship is. Worship is not a good song. Worship is your ability to sacrifice your will so that the will of the Father can find expression through you. It's a statement of death. Jesus died that death in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, 39, he said, Father, if it be thy my will, let this cup pass me by, but not my will, but thine. Death to your will. Some of us, our will is the reason why we cannot carry the spirit. God gave you your will, but as an act of worship, you surrender it to him. You wanted to live in Lagos, and God shows up. He said, what I wrote concerning you when manifesting some father, and then you sat down. They called you from Lagos. They said there's a job with Chevron. They called you. They said there's a lecturing opportunity. And when you went to God, to tell God, I want to go to Lagos, God now show you again. Samfara, Samfara. You will struggle. You will struggle until you come to a point where you die. And you say, not by way, but die. When you see men carry glory, my brother, it is the death of Jesus that makes it available. But it is your death that makes you manifest it. You can carry it bottled on your inside, but it will never manifest. Jesus, by his death, makes it available. Your sacrifice of alignment makes it available. You can't manifest any dimension until you master the way of death. Death to your will, Jesus demonstrated it. The last kind of death that Jesus demonstrated was death to the clap of men. The glories of this life, the glories, the hand clap of men. The Bible said for the price that was set before him, he despised the shame of the cross. Who taught you you can carry any dimension in God when you are still alive in yourself? Who taught you he lied to you? At best, you'll be a manipulator, a psychologist that weaves the emotion of men. Have you not gone from place to place? They say, turn three times and shout Jesus. Well, why will you not fall if you turn three times? Your balance is in the liquid that flows in your ears. When you talk three times and the liquid is scattered, you will fall. Manipulation on altars. No wonder we cannot challenge real life circumstances because we have refused to die. To our life in ourselves and want to manifest glory. The carriage of the spirit is a proponent of the degree of death that a man subjects himself to. Many cannot hear this. And that is why they will be where they are. Parkas. Open your ears and listen to me. There are many, there are too many dimensions available to us. The scarcity of manifestation is because we are alive in ourselves. Too many dimensions. Can I tell you, there is no dimension of God that has been manifested in this world and returned to heaven. In Songs of Solomon chapter 4 verse 4, the Bible said on the shield, on the mountains of God, he said the shield of many warriors are kept. The spirit and mantle of Elijah is still available in the spirit realm. The mantle of Enoch is still available in the spirit realm. The mantle of John the Baptist is still available. A lot of people say, now we are in Christ. We don't need the Old Testament prophet. They don't understand. Mantles don't belong to dispensations. Mantles are different supplies of the spirit. Created and furnished for different execution of different kingdom mandates. So whether after Christ or before Christ, a mantle is still functional. What happens in the New Testament is that every dimension of God that was ever manifested was submitted to Christ. So on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, they brought the testaments, the mantles, the graces that were available in the law and the prophets, and they submitted it to Christ. Now when you are in Christ, you begin to explore. As you travel through death and intimacy, you will come to a place and you will see the dimension of God that Elijah got through intimacy. And then you enter and you wear it like a garment. Jesus becomes a custodian of different dimensions. He becomes a custodian of different mantles. But you need to align to enter. Those dimensions, they are patterns that govern the operation. It will never change. The mantle of Abel is resonated by an excellent sacrifice. That's why every time 
they mark sacrifices. There's a grace released. It's a dimension in Abel. That dimension is in Christ. And if you yield by alignment and you become a crazy giver and you give yourself, that dimension will walk through you. And what does the mantle of Abel do? He gives you authority in the courts of heaven. Abel has authority in the courts of heaven. And only men that can talk from the courts of heaven can challenge territorial issues. Only such men can bring vengeance against evil. The reason most of us pray courts of heaven prayer we don't see results is because we have not aligned like Abel. That thing is in Christ, but your alignment will take you there. The mantle of Moses is regulated by obedience and faithfulness. If your obedience grow, you begin to sustain authority. And the authority that Moses had gave him right to provide leadership for the people of God. That's why nobody can come to leadership until he has mastered the art of obedience. No reckless, inobedient person ever comes to leadership. That's why if you don't serve, you cannot lead. It's a dimension that Moses caught. He's still in Christ. Through obedience, you come into leadership. It's a mantle. Those are the kind of mantle that regulate the forces of creation. They challenge creation and creation power. But all of these things are dead. Dimensions of death. If God wants to increase your authority and the supply of the Spirit, He begins to teach you the syllabus of death. Jacob was the custodian of the Abrahamic blessing. He was already prospering, but he has not touched what the blessing was about. The blessing that Abraham put on Jacob was not just to increase in corn and wine. The blessing that Abraham put on Jacob was a blessing that gave him a right to be a prince in heaven. If you read the book of Matthew, the Bible said, on the last day, men shall come from the north, the east, the south, and the west to come to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the blessing that Abraham gave to Jacob was to be one of the patriarchs that will be princes in heaven. Jacob carried that blessing and he was trading and getting money, cattle and sheep. When he was returning from the house of labor, the, 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 the Lord saw that this boy will die and this dimension will not be released to the world. So he came and broke him. The Bible said in Genesis 32, from verse 24 down, the angel wrestled with him from night in morning. The guy's carnality was too much. God turned this one, he defends. God turns here, he defends. But God knows that he will never be a prince until he dies. So what did God do? He broke him and he said, as a prince, thou hast power with God and hast prevailed. Did you study the life of Jacob later? In Genesis chapter 49 from verse 1, he said, gather around me. This time around, I don't try to perform anymore. Anything I say, heaven must obey because I'm a prince. I'm a prince. Even if he wakes up and you are a vagabond and you say, from now, become rich. Heaven must make you rich. They don't have a choice because you have a spirit of authority. He said, gather around me, you sons of Jacob. Stay around your father Israel and I will tell you the things that will happen to you. He didn't say I want to prophesy. He didn't say I want to bless you. He wanted to shape their destiny. Anything he tells you will become your reality. And he said, Reuben, according to the design of God, I traveled to heaven. I saw the archive of heaven. You are a man of great strength and excellence. You are the first of my strength. He said, but as unstable as water, you will not prosper. You went to the bed with my own concubine. Therefore, you will never prosper. The guy was supposed to be the first king in Israel. But he took that right from him. And when he came in verse 10, he said, The scepter will not depart from Judah, neither the lawgiver from his feet, until Shiloh comes. What did he do? He took authority from Reuben and he put it on Judah. Because the man talking is a prince. That's what death does to men. He looked at God and he said, A truth will over overtake you. But at the end, you will be delivered. When you wrote the, read the story of the Gadarene maniac, that was the prophecy of Jacob. A troop will overtake you. A literal took over one of the sons of God. The reason Jesus could not sleep that night and he had to cross the water by all means was because Jacob said what? At the end, you will be delivered. So the words that Jacob spoke many a years away, Jesus was under under or under compulsion to bring it to pass. So Jesus, tired from crusade, still went across the water and delivered God and came back because he said in the end, you will be delivered. That's a man that has the carriage of the spirit. You want to change things in your life. You want to change things in your family. Then you must go the way of death. Those things the devil brings that distracts you, 
you don't understand. It's your lifespan that is being bargained away. It's your authority, the spirit that is being negotiated. You thought you were satisfying yourself. You are actually sacrificing your own authority and eternal dynasty for momentary pleasure. This is why we cry. When we rate judgment against sin, it's not because we want to condemn men. Men are not aware. Spirits have deceived men. Tonight we must cry. We must cry. Teach me the way of death. Teach me the way of death. You want to stand, stand. You want to sit, sit. Any disposition that helps you to connect, this is the time. This message is not for everybody. I came to sound an alarm for the sons of order in the house. It's not for everybody. But if you have heard me, then you are part of what God is doing in the last day. Cry to the Lord. Teach me the way of death. Sapa teke barabash. Neriana tavash kapali atatara. Boroka sekaina tavu. Chansilata. When next the devil brings deception, no, that is not your emotion. A spirit is whispering that you dive out of the path of your destiny. The ancient pathways are eternal. The ancient pathways are forever patterns. God will never compromise on them. Every time the devil shows up, remember, it's not your emotion. It's a lying spirit. It's a deceiving spirit. Your destiny is being okay. Your advantage in the spirit is being negotiated. Some of you are the borrowers, the borrowers. Oh, what wash. But the devil wants to deceive you away from your destiny. Jesus died to fail. Jesus died to lost. Jesus died to be mysterious statue. Jesus died to his will. Jesus died to the hand clap of men. Every one of us must die. He's the author and the finish of our faith. Tonight, there must be a shift in paradigm. There must be a shift. Look at your life. That place the devil comes to deceive you. Discover it tonight. And say, shame on Satan. Shame on Satan. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.